remember her dreams when she wakes up. I mean, I, to my, myself, it's like if I just got done having this conversation with you, I wake up in the morning, I remember the conversation I had with you. That's how my dreams are. And that, and you know, I, I like, how can I say it? Sometimes if I have a dream I really like, you know, and it, it, it's like I'm in another world or another time or another dimension, another country, whatever, um, you know, I, I will play that dream out as long as I can. Sometimes it'll play out two, three, four nights in a row. And then all of a sudden, you know, it stops. And all of a sudden a week later, you know, there's closure to it. I have, a, you know, and it all kind of all fits together. I, I, I love this, Gary. Yes, it's a great exercise to see whether you can improve the story, change the script, write a different scenario if you're not satisfied with what is going on in a dream. And this is practice in reality creation. We're not talking about the new age silly version of this thing. We're talking about how you can use your imagination to design and bring about certain effects. If you can learn to do this in the dream space, you might find you've got a better chance of doing it in ordinary reality as well. I do want to notice that sometimes you can't simply change the script. Sometimes you can't simply change the circumstances of a dream. For example, I, I dream I'm having a very good time in a certain situation in a body that is much better than mine, much more athletic, can do all sorts of things. But uh, on the edge of a cliff, I realize inside the dream, I cannot fly. We can fly, of course, in many dreams. This, one of the things that people enjoy about dreams is that they can fly. They can do other things they can't physically do. In this dream, I'm in a world that has its own solid physics, and I cannot. I've got a marvelous body, rather like those blue beings in the movie Avatar. I can't just jump off the cliff without killing myself. I can do things like swing on vines and trees in a way I couldn't ordinarily do. I can do things like ride strange creatures like the things in Avatar, but I cannot just jump off a cliff because I'm in a dream reality that has its own solidity. In other words, in my opinion, I'm in another world with its own physics. It's not just simply a made-up world that is artificial uh, and therefore can be pushed and pulled in any direction that my ordinary mind may choose. I I'm in a world where I cannot jump off a cliff and fly, even though I'm quite familiar with flying and many other kinds of dreams. And so in that way, that's just one example, there are dream situations where you cannot, for one reason or another, simply re-script the reality and rewrite the movie altogether. When you can do that, give it a shot, absolutely. But sometimes you find or feel that you're in an alternate reality, as I say, with its own laws and its own physics, and sometimes you find in a dream that you're in a situation that is so close to manifestation in this world, in this physical reality, that changing the story will, inquire, will require action on a physical level in this world. For example, avoiding that fatal accident on the road that I described. I couldn't change that. I might have tried to do it at the time in, in, while still connected with the dream. I couldn't change the scenario in the dream space. The, the dream required me to do something in physical reality in order to avoid an unwanted event. So uh, once again, I applaud you for rewriting the script, claiming the ability to choose, uh, deciding you know, who you're going to be married to or not in the dream and all of that. That's great. However, sometimes we need to recognize that dreams have a solidity that prevents us from simply rewriting things. The solidity might be either, as I say, that we are actually in another dimension, in another world with its own laws and its own physics, or the solidity, so to speak, might be that the dream is so close to physical manifestation in this world that only physical action in this world can alter what you see in the dream. I agree with that, what you're saying. Now, hey, i got to ask you a question. Do you remember the, the TV show back, oh, maybe 10 years ago called Sliders? Sliders, yes, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was really infatuated with that show because, it, you know, looking at it, you know, people... At the time it was on, some scientists would come on and say, oh, that could never happen. But, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I could, do you feel like we could travel like to a, another parallel universe like, like Sliders did and be there? You know, the thing is, you could be there 30 seconds or, or one minute, and actually that could be a whole lifetime because there is no such thing as time. Well, yeah, I think I think it's a plausible scenario. I mean, I know that we do this in consciousness. I mean, I know that we do this in dreaming, for example, and that we can do this 
in conscious or lucid dreaming, we can do this. Can we physically do it? Well, maybe. Uh, I remember the even older show, Quantum Leap. Do you remember that one? Oh, I do. I do. I mean, that, 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 one, that, one, is, that one is quite popular for those who remember it with a certain kind of dreamer. You know, we wake up in a dream. Inside a dream, we wake up to the fact that we're in a body that doesn't look like the regular one. And like the character in, in Quantum Leap, the doctor, who's sort of condemned to jump in and out of bodies to sort things out, you look at yourself in the bathroom mirror and say, what am I doing in this body at this time? Do I have an assignment? Then there's sliders, yes, yeah, slipping in and out of parallel realities. Then there's a long, run, long running series, Fringe. Do you remember Fringe? Vaguely, yeah, vaguely. I, I, I enjoyed Fringe a lot. Parallel worlds are bumping up against each other. So we have, you know, some um, uh, models from TV and from movies about these things. Uh, there's, a, there's, there's a movie called Sliding Doors when we're thinking about parallel realities. And the story, the story, which is told very nicely, is about parallel lives. Uh, the, and the difference between them is that in one version, she manages to get on the subway car, and in the other version, she doesn't. Depending on whether or not she gets through the sliding doors on time, her life goes one way or it goes the other way. So yeah, the movies and TV have given us some models for understanding this business about parallel realities, and even to understand, thinking about back to sliders, we might be able to consciously and boldly go into a parallel life and maybe do something interesting. I'm just wondering if, if anybody has actually gone into a parallel life uh, and, and and basically swapped and, and uh, didn't come back to, well, this, uh, you know, uh, didn't come back to the life that they led, that yeah, they left. Right. And, whether, and then, then, of course, the other thought comes up, Gary, would anyone notice that they're missing? <laughs> I mean, if, we, if it's consciousness that's traveling and not the physical body, and you leave your physical body and go into a parallel life, uh, what happens inside the body and brain you've left behind? Does the parallel person come and inhabit that body and brain? Or are you just sort of missing and nobody notices, but you're just quieter than usual? Uh, <laughs> in terms of the mobility of consciousness, all of this is very, very possible. In fact, I think it goes on all the time. In terms of what the physical body can do, there are certain limitations, obviously, uh, as far as we understand it. But consciousness itself is mobile. I mean, science is telling us we have access at any moment to the whole vast, limitless region of non-local mind. So consciousness is really impeded in its travels only by a lack of courage and imagination. So in consciousness, you can certainly go into a parallel life and hopefully you won't lose yourself there or get into a real fight with a parallel self that doesn't want you around, because that can happen too. I mean, while we're talking about this as if we are masters of the universe, we're talking about parallel lives. Think about this, Gary. There's an alternate Gary who's interested in you and might be trying to check in on you and look at your, in on your life from time to time and even maybe jump into your head and body during the night and have a look around. How about that idea? It's not right. just us looking out. It's others looking in. Well, maybe we swap, you know, during our dream cycle, you know, all of a sudden, you know, that person is in my body and I'm in their body. So we kind of like swap. So our dreams are actually what's going on in our life. I don't know. It, it, you know. Well, well you'll, you'll find that some of the stories, and these are stories of experience. This is not fiction. Read like fiction. Some of the stories in, in my new book, Mysterious Realities, very much take you into these realms. The idea that we might swap roles from time to time, swap bodies from time to time with parallel selves. I mean, I explore this, uh, and I not only explore it, but I'm writing from direct experience of these things. So uh, you might enjoy that. Well, yeah. Can you tell a little bit about your book without giving any plot away? I will say this. One of my friends is texting me right now while we're on the air. He is a believer that we're in a metrics that we're nothing more than basically on a computer chip, and, and that's how our life is controlled. I, I you know, I don't really buy his his philosophy. I, I do believe that we can travel onto a parallel universe or universes because I think there's so many of them, you know, that is duplicating what we're doing right now. I I just feel like you know, so many people have had experiences where they just can't explain it. And and there's no way you can explain some of them. Well, the things that are hard to explain but possible to experience. I mean, I, I follow a way of experience. Yes, I'm capable of coming up with some concepts and some models of understanding, but 
For me, it's the adventure that comes first. There's a moment in Alice in Wonderland where the griffin and the mock turtle are having a discussion, and they're, they're talking about whether you should have the adventure before the discussion or the discussion before the adventure, and the griffin says, first the adventure, later the discussion. Discussions take a very long time. I'm with the griffin. I'm in favor of direct experience of these things. Absent experience, you don't have much to go on. So we can experience sometimes more easily than we can explain things like this model of parallel realities we're talking about. I'm not in favor of any model of human life or human consciousness that reduces us to an analogy with something created by human invention. Why should we compare ourselves to chips in a computer when those are things created by humans? Obviously, we are larger than the things we have created, all the things we created, at least in science fiction, could one day try to rule us and, and lord it over us. Why should we compare the workings of the mind to a computer created by the human mind? The mind is greater than any computer. The mind is greater than the brain. The mind is not confined to the brain. The brain is an instrument, a transceiver, through which we receive something from the mind. So I'm in favor of a very adventurous and bold approach to what is available to humans as an evolving order of consciousness. I'm in favor of us awakening to the fact that we are, in fact, multidimensional beings operating in a multidimensional universe, and that to understand what's going on, we have to experience a lot more and grow our practice of entering in consciousness the realities that are being speculated about. So, you know, Mysterious Realities, the new book that I wrote, is really a collection of travelers' tales not from other worlds, from other dimensions, but also from travels in this world, because a lot of this for me, and this is how I live every day, is about waking up to the fact that ordinary life is a dream world. We are surrounded by signs and symbols that are speaking to us all the time. We attract and repel different things according to our state of mind, our feelings, and our energy. And it is in those moments of meaningful coincidence or synchronicity that we sometimes come quiveringly, vibrantly alive to the play of larger forces in our lives. We've been talking a lot about dreaming. Well, in dreaming, we sort of go through the curtain walls of our everyday assumptions and discover something that is out there. Through synchronicity, it's as if the forces of the larger universe come poking or pushing through the curtains of ordinary understanding to bring us awake. So a lot of the stories in mysterious realities are actually stories of remarkable uh, occasions of synchronicity in which sometimes you feel that forces far beyond the ordinary are manifesting on the earth plane. So that's very much what the book is about, not just getting out there and dreaming, but getting in there in the sense of recognizing that in meaningful coincidence, something very, very important, very, very exciting is going on. Oh, wow. And I, I got to ask you a question. How long did it take you to write this this particular uh, number 25 of your book, a book? Well, it took me a long time in the sense that the stories have bubbled up over time. I I'd like to tell you the story of how the book came about as a publication. May I do that? Oh, please. You're the guest. Yes, uh, that's what you're okay, here for. So, so I'd, been, I'd been putting stories on one side over some years from my adventures, and I thought Mysterious Realities might be the title for them, but I hadn't really made a publication plan. I was just keeping things, many, many cases, almost complete, unfinished stories in a folder. And then I've been, then I was teaching a workshop in Berkeley, California. I'm walking to dinner with my coordinator and I'm talking about three things to her as we walk along the street. First, I'm talking about Pegasus, the winged horse. I'm recalling that in the Greek myth, Pegasus, Pegasus stamps his hooves on a mountain and opens the springs of inspiration, the spring of the muses. So I'm talking about Pegasus as a creative uh, catalyst. And I'm talking about the idea, I have these unfinished stories. I'm calling them almost complete stories that I might do something with. I'm talking about the fact that many of the stories about parallel lives, about the idea that we're living twice or more than twice at the same time. So this is the conversation. Here's the synchronistic bit. I look across the street, and at this moment, I see Pegasus, the winged horse, on the front of a bookstore. I say to my friend, excuse me, I've got to go across the street. I start running across the street. Berkeley Drive was a kind of pedestrian, so I wasn't run down as I hopped between the traffic. I'm standing in the doorway of the Pegasus bookshop, and I look, and at eye level on a shelf right in front of me is my surname, Moss, on the spine of a book. The title of the book is Almost Complete 
poems. It's very close to the phrase I'm using, almost complete story.